On February 21st, 2019, Manny Machado signed a 10-year, $300 million contract with the Padres, the richest deal to that point in North American sporting history. No one was surprised. A month later, The Athletic announced an anonymous survey of Machado's peers had dubbed him the league's dirtiest player. Again, no one was surprised. But maybe we should have been. Or maybe we should not have been so surprised by what's happened since. By Manny Machado's supposedly shocking transformation from MLB's supervillain to beloved clubhouse leader. Yes, maybe, just maybe, had we watched Machado's career a bit more closely with a bit less judgment, had we listened to his teammates a bit more carefully with a bit less cynicism, we would have seen this villain to role model redemption arc coming a mile away. I can practically feel your eyes rolling, but hold on, bear with me, I'll show you what I mean. Our tale begins in baseball love in Miami, where Manny Machado was born on July 6th, 1992. On a crash course for MLB superstardom practically since he could walk, an intensely talented 17-year-old Machado was selected third overall by the Orioles in 2010. For the next two years, he lit up the minors at shortstop, but Baltimore already had a shortstop in veteran J.J. Hardy. So when Machado was called up to the majors in August 2012, he debuted at third base. Almost immediately, Manny started making headlines. And though most of us remember this stretch of his career for the endless controversies, which, don't worry, we'll get to that. To understand his journey, it's critical not to ignore what Manny accomplished on the field. On August 10, 2012, in the second game of Machado's big league career, he hit two home runs, becoming the 12th youngest player in MLB history with a multi-homer game. Two days later, he blasted his third. But more important than these home runs, at least more important for understanding Manny's legacy, is what he did next. Play. For the rest of the 2012 season, Machado played every single game, foreshadowing an attribute that's been universally lauded by his past and present teammates. For all the criticisms of his demeanor, when Manny Machado is healthy, meaning even close to healthy, Manny Machado is going to play. And this isn't something new. Manny's been an Iron Man since day one. Since day one, his teammates have loved him for it just like they loved him for what he did in 2013. In Manny's first full season in the bigs, he led the league in at-bats and doubles, earned his first all-star nod, and finished top 10 in AL MVP voting. Even more impressively, Manny's massive 23.2 defensive runs scored earned him his first gold glove, which became a platinum glove shortly thereafter, when Machado was named the AL's top defender at any position in 2013. This would have been extraordinary for any 21-year-old, let alone one playing in his first full season in the show. When we recall that Manny rarely played anything other than shortstop in the minors, it's downright incredible. That platinum glove is not, however, the only noteworthy point about Manny's swap to third base. In fact, this was the first moment of his career that, had we been watching a bit more carefully, might have clued us into the all-for-one, one-for-all mentality that's helped Machado stand out to his teammates since day one. Let me explain. By 2013, Baltimore shortstop J.J. Hardy was entering the tail end of his career, but remained an asset, as his 2013 F-War of 3.2 ranked 9th amongst big league shortstops. Machado was the opposite, equal parts unproven commodity and game-changing phenom. More relevantly, as a high draft pick earmarked to be the Orioles' next superstar, Manny had the franchise at his beck and call, and could certainly have made a fuss about being forced to switch positions to accommodate the aging Hardy. But no, Manny didn't protest for an instant and the grace with which he handled the situation wasn't lost on Hardy, who spent untold hours getting to know Machado as they fielded grounders in practice, and who's had nothing but good things to say about him since. That's really hard to put myself in those shoes, Hardy told The Athletic in 2019. Being 18, 19 years old, and a superstar, and being compared to guys like Alex Rodriguez, with the success he had at such a young and early age, there's not a whole lot of people in this world that can understand. Alas, there were a lot of people who couldn't understand the things Manny did wrong, and just like the praise of his teammates, the misadventures of those early years in Baltimore must be acknowledged, if we're to understand Manny Machado's full circle journey. In early June 2014, the A's headed east for a series in Baltimore. In the first game, Oakland's Josh Donaldson, the MLB's other most controversial third baseman, tagged Manny out, and did it somewhat more, shall we say, enthusiastically than Manny would have liked. This led to a benches clearing argument, but no blows thrown. Now, I'll just toss in my two cents, which aren't exactly controversial, and say it sure looks like Manny overreacted. Then again, we can't know exactly what was going on behind the scenes. Maybe Donaldson really did tag him harder than he should have. Whatever the truth, there's no justifying what followed. The next day, on the tail end of one of Manny's trademarked triumphant backswings, the tip of his bat caught Oakland catcher Derek Norris in the face mask, forcing Norris to leave the game. 
No one seemed to suspect nefarious intent, and Machado, in the aftermath, both apologized to Norris and maintained the incident was a mistake. The trouble is, just two innings later, after being brushed back by Oakland reliever Fernando Abad, Machado did this. There goes the bat. Oh, oh. You know where that bat was intended to go? To the pitcher. And that's why Norris, that's why the catcher would have jumped out in front. And here they go. So, yeah, that's not great. And in case you thought this one was an accident, Manny all but confirmed the opposite. When he told reporters after the game, it was a frustrating weekend, and I just let my emotions get the best of me. Yeah, not great. And neither was Manny's next incident, though it wasn't so cut and dry. On June 6, 2016, two years to the day after Manny's dust-up with Donaldson, he got into it with late Kansas City fireballer Yodano Ventura. Following two tense at-bats, replete with 98 mile per hour pitches that kept tailing further and further inside, Ventura drilled Machado in the back, leading to one hell of a brawl. And here we go. And Manny and Ventura are going at it on the mound. In hindsight, both players were in the wrong, but Manny probably did have a better case, as Ventura really could have caused an injury with any one of those blazing fastballs, including the one that plunked Machado. But the real takeaway from this incident has more to do with its consequences than assigning blame. While Ventura was suspended 8 games, and Machado only 4, Manny was the better player, far more valuable to his playoff contending team, not to mention that an 8 game suspension for a starting pitcher is actually only a 1 game suspension, because the pitcher only takes the mound every 5 days. This means, by letting his emotions get the best of him, Manny had acted selfishly, because the consequences didn't affect just Manny, they affected the entire Orioles team. Keep that in mind, it'll be important later on. Manny's final headline-making controversy as an Oriole began on April 21, 2017, and played out across the next two weeks. As he slid into second, Machado spiked beloved Red Sox Dustin Pedroia in a play that, much like the Derek Norris incident, Manny has always insisted was accidental. However, despite Machado's apparent remorse, by this point, his reputation as a dirty player was ingrained. The Sox were having none of it. From April 21st to May 3rd, Boston pitchers Eduardo Rodriguez, Matt Barnes, and Chris Sale would all have a turn throwing at Machado. Though none of their pitches hit him, the intent was clear enough, and led to an epic post-game rant, in which Manny described the constant targeting as effing BS, then effing BS again, then coward stuff, then for good measure, effing BS one more time. Again, you can make your own decision about whether Machado was to blame for the Red Sox beef. What can't be argued is by 2017, Manny Machado's reputation had caught up with him. If opposing teams even sniffed foul play, Manny was as good as guilty. The same was true, incidentally, for Manny's reputation as the ultimate bad guy amongst MLB fans. 2018 was the last year of Machado's contract with Baltimore, and the 47 and 115 Orioles were epically bad. Fearing Machado would walk for nothing in free agency, Baltimore dealt him to the Dodgers midseason, opening Chapter 2 in the tale of Manny Machado. A short chapter in terms of length, but not controversy. Manny performed well in the regular season for the Dodgers, accumulating an impressive 2.7 F war in just 66 games, putting him on pace for 6.6 .6 wins above replacement across a full season, a mark that would have ranked second amongst all MLB shortstops. And no, that wasn't me misspeaking. I did say shortstop, not third baseman because Manny's role in LA was to fill in for the injured Corey Seager. Just like in Baltimore, the ease with which Manny switched positions was downright incredible. He posted a massive 14.9 defensive runs per 150 innings in LA, the second best mark of his career, all while playing the grand majority of his games at a position he'd hardly ever played in the majors, not to mention the most challenging non-catcher defensive assignment in the game. Alas, for all that regular season success, Manny's stint with the Dodgers will always be remembered for the playoffs. Equipped with an enormously talented roster, the 2018 Dodgers had their hearts set on a World Series title. LA did make the series, but lost to the Red Sox in five. Dodgers fans needed someone to blame. Machado, who'd never been anything but a second half rental, was the perfect scapegoat. Not only were Machado's postseason numbers awful, complete with a 227 batting average and season ending strikeout, he drew the ire of Dodgers fans, and for that matter, the entire baseball community, when he swung 3 0 in a 0 0 NLCS game against the Brewers, then declined to hustle down the line on a surefire ground out. Machado's post game comments only made matters worse. Obviously, I'm not going to change, he told reporters. I'm not the kind of player that's going to be, quote, Johnny Hustle, and run down the line and slide to first base. That's just not my personality. That's not my cup of tea. That's not who I am. As you would expect, Dodgers fans were irate, so much so that what Machado said next often gets lost in the shuffle. Should I have run on that pitch? Yeah, but I didn't, and I gotta pay the consequences for it. It does look bad. It looks terrible. I look back at the video, and I'm like, whoa, what was I doing? 
Now, I want to be very clear that these comments do not get Machado off the hook, but they are worth mentioning because they draw light to a different side of Manny Machado, a side that, just like his Iron Man work ethic, has been present since day one. Manny Machado does acknowledge his mistakes. He also, of course, tends to say a lot of other things as he acknowledges them, and those things tend to be infuriating. The point is, had we paid attention to everything he said, rather than focusing exclusively on the most outrageous sound bites, Chapter 3 in the tale of Manny Machado might not have been so surprising as it seems. In spite of his ugly postseason, in early 2019, Manny signed a $300 million contract with the Padres. It was in San Diego at last his reputation began to change, perhaps because in San Diego at last, Manny Machado's journey had gone full circle. As you'll recall, when Manny debuted with the Orioles in 2012, he was a 20-year-old phenom of Dominican descent, a shortstop of otherworldly natural talent, tasked with reversing the fate of an MLB franchise. Eight years later, while expectations were high for Manny's on-field performance with the Padres, suddenly he had a new role as well. Mentor. See, for all the hype surrounding Manny's $300 million deal, San Diego had another player in the pipeline with even higher expectations. And that player just so happened to be a 20-year-old Dominican shortstop, a phenom of otherworldly talent, precisely as Manny had been eight years before. In case you haven't pieced it together, I'm talking about El Nino, Fernando Tatis Jr. But back to Manny for a moment. 2019 was a disappointment, with the Padres finishing last in the NL West at 70-92. But in spite of the lackluster record, in spite of Manny's subpar numbers, he finished the year with a 2.2 F war, the second lowest of his career. Manny was an instant hit in the clubhouse, surprising everyone with his maturity and leadership. But again, I'll ask, should we really have been so surprised? And this time I'll answer, no. Here are my reasons why. For all of his gaffes, Manny Machado has always held himself to an extremely high standard. Remember the ground ball he didn't run out in LA? Was it infuriating? Sure. Should Manny have hustled? Obviously. But the reason he didn't hustle was that he was irate with himself for grounding out, when he was swinging for a tie-breaking homer. And Manny never for an instant denied he'd done something wrong. By contrast, he took full responsibility, just like he usually does. One thing Manny does not do, however, is lie to reporters by telling them he'll turn into something he's not. If a player we liked did the same, we'd call him honest. When it's Manny Machado, we call him selfish. Which, he isn't. In fact, Manny was desperate to make good on that massive $300 million investment from San Diego, just like he's always felt his duty is to live up to expectations. Further, by this point in his career, Machado was mature enough to understand that a $300 million contract carries expectations well beyond the diamond. Happily, he soon started performing on the field as well. In a COVID-shortened 2020 season, Machado and Tatis Jr. were incredible on the left side of San Diego's infield, leading the Padres to a 37-23 record and their first playoff berth since 2006. While San Diego did succumb to a historically great Dodgers squad in the NLCS, no one was blaming Manny any longer. The opposite, in fact. Not only did Manny's on-field performance rebound to the tune of a 950 OPS in 2020, his value as a leader soon came into focus. In 2021, Korean star Ha Sung Kim debuted with the Padres. Per ESPN's Jeff Passan, as Kim acclimated to life in a new country, Machado embraced, mentored, and helped acclimate him. Pretty much every day, every minute, Kim told Passan, he's trying to help me out and help me improve my game to play better. So I want to do better because of him trying so hard to help me out. The guy never wants to quit. So that makes us play even harder, play better. He's the captain for sure. And Kim wasn't the only example of Manny's leadership. The best example, at least the most visible example, came a few months later, not in a moment of triumph, but in one of the Padres' darkest hours. Following a torrid start to 2021, a season in which Manny, despite playing through injury, was phenomenal, and Fernando Tatis Jr., in his first full season as a big leaguer, was even better, the Padres shockingly fell off a cliff. From August 13th onward, they posted the MLB's worst record, and had nearly relinquished their stranglehold on the NL's second wildcard when this happened on September 18th in a game against the same Cardinals who were threatening to seize San Diego's wildcard slot. Depending on your level of obsession, you've probably already watched that clip somewhere between one and one million times. So we won't do a deep dive, but we will cover the basics. 
Before Manny lit into Tatis Jr. in the dugout, the latter had been called out on strikes, then proceeded to show up the home plate umpire. Manny was upset because, in his words, Tatis Jr. was the best player in the world, but that it wasn't all about him. If Tatis Jr. got booted for showing up an umpire, Tatis Jr. couldn't help the Padres win. Manny was saying that as a superstar, El Nino had a bigger responsibility to his teammates, not a smaller one. It was El Nino's job to go play baseball. It was his job to do what was best for the team. Now let's rewind that endless list of controversies covered in Chapter 2. Remember the incident between Machado and Ventura? It was the incident in which Manny, the Orioles' best player, was probably justified in his anger, but still shouldn't have charged the mound, because the Orioles couldn't afford to lose their best player in a pennant race. Sound familiar? Yep, just like Tatis Jr.'s background is incredibly similar to Manny's, Tatis Jr.'s mistake was one Manny had already made himself. What's more, when Manny did it in 2016, no one in Baltimore gave him a hard time. When Orioles manager Buck Showalter was asked if he was disappointed with Manny's behavior, Showalter said, no. Orioles center fielder Adam Jones went one step further, pleading to pay Manny's fine. What's remarkable is that in spite of all that support, and even though he didn't bother saying as much to the press, Manny did learn from the Ventura incident. Clearly, he remembered his mistake five years later. Clearly, he remembered what it was like to be in exactly the same position as Tatis Jr., and understood that as the only person in San Diego's dugout with first-hand experience of being one of the game's most talented young stars, not to mention the only Padre making money anywhere close to El Nino's, it was Manny's job to step in, for the good of the team. 2022 was more of the same, more missteps from Tatis Jr., more Manny busting his ass to pick up the slack, which he did to the tune of 7.3 F war, the most of any MLB third baseman, the second best of any MLB player, and the highest mark of Machado's career. Today, with six years remaining on Manny's deal, but a player opt-out clause looming at the end of next season, there are no doubts whatsoever of Manny Machado's value in and out of the clubhouse. No, the only doubt in the mind of Padres management is whether a five-year commitment worth $150 million is as much as he's worth. We set out to decide whether Manny Machado's transformation from villain to leader was one we should have seen coming. In the process, a new question is formed. Is it possible Manny Machado was a leader all along? My answer? Sort of. There's no getting around the horrific mistakes of Manny's early career, but there's also no getting around his constant commitment to his team, and perhaps, more importantly, his willingness to grow. But how can a player who's always performed, even through injuries, continue to grow? He can do so by learning from his mistakes, by embracing his impact as a leader. Manny Machado, beyond any doubt, has always been a villain and a leader. So maybe it was just a matter of time before he morphed into one of baseball's greatest leaders overall. Or maybe, just maybe, Manny Machado has had that in him all along. At least, the best leader he could be, as he suffered through the growing pains of all those expectations. And it was just that blustering bravado that made it so hard to tell.